born. We're all born with a passion. And for some of us, our passions either become our careers, some of us it stays as a hobby, for others, like myself, it became a way of life. And depending on where you want to go with it, it can either make you who you need to be, it can structure you in a way that can maybe develop you into a person that you thought you could never be. For me, cycling was my passion. It was everything that I ever wanted to do, and it's all I ever thought about. When I was growing up through school, I must have driven my parents crazy because all I ever thought about was bicycles, bicycles, bicycles. And when my parents said to me, are you doing your homework? I was like, yes, I'm doing my homework, but I was in my room playing with my bicycle. You know, and um, it was something that I really wanted to turn into the way forward. And by the time, just before my 11th birthday, most of you will know the August cycle tour, I had completed my first August cycle tour. And by the time I was 21, there was only a handful of us that had ever done 10 Augusts by the age of 21. And that record still stands of today. Now, during this time, I realized at some point that I'm going to have to develop some form of career besides riding, because if anything ever goes wrong or you know, when I retire one day from riding, I'm going to have to have an alternative income. My parents were like, you are not going to go to university, you mess around too much, you play the bicycle, you're never at home, you're on your bicycle. So it became the only thing that they said, no, you need to go and get another job. So what I ended up doing was I ended up becoming a jeweler by doing an apprenticeship during the same time. Now, I used the same concepts of structure, routine, and discipline put into jewelry with the fine skills and elements and the finer detail that jewelry would bring about. Now, last year, March, we were all busy training for SA championships and for uh, provincial championships. Now, I specialized in multiple routines ranging from road cycling to mountain biking to tandem to track cycling. Now, most of you, if you don't know what track cycling is, it it's a track like this that you probably would have seen at the Rio Olympics. And um, on the 18th of March last year, I was dedicated completely and I was pushing myself beyond any limit that I ever had been. Until the biggest event of my life was about to appear. And it pretty much happened in a split second. Where my world, my passion, my life would literally come to an end. During a freak accident while I was training at high speed, according to reports, I had a seizure at close to 70 kilometers an hour, and I hit the deck head on. I ended up, as you can see in the scan here, with multiple brain injuries. And if you, for those that don't know what you're looking at here, right in the center is where I had multiple scarring, bleeding, and tearing of the brain. When, arrived, uh, when the paramedics arrived at the, the track, they had to work on me for over an hour, which falls outside your golden window period. They had to bring me back, and apparently, in accordance to reports also, I was dead on the scene. They managed to bring me back and then take, took me through to the hospital, where again I collapsed, and the doctors had to bring me back to life again. I sustained over 32 points of injury, ranging from breakages, dislocations, um, torn muscles, and major internal bleeding. This is a thoracic scan where I had collapsed both lungs. I had major internal bleeding, and doctors were pretty much, you're not going to make the 24 hours, and if you did make the 24 hours, I would be pretty much brain damaged for the rest of my life. To give an example as to what I really looked like, this is a video of what I looked like after two months. Essentially, my brain was having a short circuit party. My eyes were dancing to show the rhythm. Um, but yeah, I was just not there whatsoever. This is two months after the accident. Up until this point, I was having to learn to walk and talk and read and write all over again. My eyes, because of my, uh, my visual cortex being damaged, would shake from left to right. And I couldn't talk and tell anybody what was going on. I was pretty much trapped in a broken body with no way out. I couldn't tell people what I was feeling. I wasn't able to go anywhere except have my eyes move all over the place and just hope for the best. During this stage, I had to now configure 
myself somehow internally because I knew what was going on. I just could not get it out to the rest of the world. So what do you do? The only way I could explain to people was it felt like I was sitting on a bench and across the road and watching the world go by. I just did not know how to cross the road to reach back to this world. The only things that I could kind of comprehend with over serious amounts of therapy and occupational therapy with my neuro, uh, Dr. Mike Isaacs, and my occupational therapy, uh, Jennifer uh, Bruton, it was endless and endless of hours. I figured that the only things that worked for me were pictures and numbers. If I could correlate a picture to a number or a number to a picture, I could understand it. So things like food, which you can't associate a picture and a number together, I did not understand. To me, I'd never had a banana in my life. And when I tasted it for the first time, I was like, I cannot believe your people are holding back on me from something that grows from a tree. How crazy is that? I didn't know what a cupcake or a muffin was. I thought cake was another colored bread. I just couldn't understand why you put the sweet stuff on it and you didn't put butter on it. It was just super weird. I had never had Coca-Cola to me, and uh, everything you drank I thought was called juice. So I was having tea juice, coffee juice, cola juice. I still catch myself calling cola juice today. And, but, you know, I, I kind of had to embrace humor about this because, you know, I died twice already, and dying doesn't quite work for me. So I thought, well, the only thing I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to have to find humor in the whole aspect. So with the pictures and numbers, my background is obviously with the jewelry, which took me around the world. I've managed to live and work in over 67 countries around the world. And having that said, I got exposed to the latest technologies, including 3D printing. When I came back home from overseas, areas that I got involved with was aerospace, aeronautical, and primarily medical, with facial reconstruction and implantology, where we would design preoperative models that the doctors could practice surgeries on before. We'd do surgical guided systems so they could place the implants properly and instrumentation. Now, one of the projects that we were also working with in the industrial sector and the media sector was these virtual reality glasses, which most of you would have seen them on Google Glasses, and we were busy with a project prior to my accident for BBC, where they wanted to be able to take reporting and let people be able to see what was happening at the scene live. So by watching YouTube videos, uh, music, music videos with lyrics, I was then able to watch people's faces, hear the tones, and read the words, and that's how I learned to start reading again and associating sound to facial expressions because the, visual, uh, the, the portion of the brain that controls your emotions was also damaged, so I only understand humor, impatience, and frustration. The rest to me, love, lust, everything. I know where the words are used, just don't know what it feels like. So by utilizing virtual reality, to, let me explain to you, how many times can you practice frying an egg in a day? Now, at occupational therapy, they give you blocks and toys. So essentially, you work from hand to brain, and that's how you learn. Now, with me having my long-term memory and short-term memory damage, it was going to take too long. So I figured, I'm stuck in this body, so that means in my mind, I still work, but my hands don't. So what happens if I could create a structure where I could trick my brain to thinking that I had done whatever task 100,000 times, and then subconsciously make my hands do what I was supposed to? And that's what we did, and that's how I started to learn cognitive skill again. So to give you an example, after training, most of us have played with a Rubik's Cube before, but most of us, like, if you're like me in the beginning, we used to take the stickers off and move them around and then put it back together. Don't lie, you've all been there, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Where's this? I tricked my brain into thinking I knew how to do a Rubik's Cube. Now, well, the way I worked was very much based on the same principles as binary coding like they do for programming computers. Where if there's four squares next to each other, you used a zero. If there's any other lines, it was a, uh, a one. So it was one zeros, one zeros, and I knew which way to turn the Rubik's Cube. And this is in real time. This is not sped up or anything. This is me working in real time. Now, some people will take months to get going. This took me just over a month to, to strict my brain enough to be able to think that I can do a Rubik's Cube. And the more I did it, the forester I became. And to a point where you'll see in the video shortly that I actually start working on the back of the Rubik's Cube without even having to look at it because I knew exactly which way my binary codes were kind of working. You can see how fast it eventually becomes. You see that there I'm working on the behind the screen and I knew exactly where I needed to go because in my mind I'd done 100,000 times before. And there you go, Rubik's Cube done. And that's for somebody that's now suffering and class legally as 
literally brain damaged. I have a certificate to prove it, so I can use it whenever I want. Maybe get free parking, I don't know, maybe a free meal, I don't know. You know. But yeah, it definitely does work. And this might change the way occupational therapy gets done today. This is what I look like on September this year, as broken as anything. On the right-hand side, the black and white picture, is that if you look at your ribs, they're not supposed to be nice and smooth. Your clavicle's supposed to be great. Mine looks like a braille book with epilepsy, and um, it doesn't quite really work. So now the question was, when I was doing the Rubik's Cube, I started to lose a lot of feeling and control of my right hand and right arm. When I went for the scan, we realized that we were in a major, major trouble because my subclavial artery that runs down the inside of your arm was trapped by the bones that were broken or stitching wrong. Not only that was my brachial plexus nerve, which comes from your spine around the top of your arm and down the inside, that was damaged, so I started to lose feeling. And if we didn't do something soon, I stand the chance of losing my arm by January. Now, the question is, you can't just go and shove me back into theater, because if you do, because of the brain injury, I won't survive theater, especially if I lost, I mean, theater longer than three hours because of the anesthesia. Currently, the trauma and the theater itself looking between 10 to 12 hours surgery. So now what do we do? I have to dig deep, I have to look at what I used to do, and thank goodness my previous um, training in the jewelry field and the 3D printing world is all about pictures and numbers, and that's the only thing I understood. So what we did was, well, I went for a CT scan, which most of you know, and I, I met with the guys again from Amsterdam, where we take my CT scan, we work in virtual reality once again, where if you look at the two balls that the guy's ha holding, it's got markers on it, and they can take my CT scan and work in virtual reality as if they're actually operating me in real time, working on different densities of your body because your bone's made up of a certain density, soft tissue's made up of a certain density, and we're able to look for complications and how to work the surgery to be able to reduce the surgery time. You can see how you can scan in and out of the brain without any issues or reality subjection to the, the patient itself. So this really started to change the game again and gave me a little bit of hope of that I might be able to survive this. By utilizing the same stepping motions of the motors in theater, we were then able to see what we are going to do. We were then able to watch it all live simultaneously and make the call as to how we are going to do the surgery. Once we did that, I extracted the information because your body made up a different density. I extracted the density of bone and then I was able to then take that and put it onto a 3D printing machine and print it out of the same density of what my bones are made of. So that way we were then able to take them to theater and do trial simulations of cutting the bone to make sure that we don't waste any areas or that might cause issues. But yeah, it really did help a lot. Those are the bones once they're printed. We printed quite a few so we could do multiple surgeries on it and work out the cutting guides so that the doctors can cut exactly right. Now, the reason why we had to go this route besides, you know, the anesthesia is because my subclavial artery now being caught by the bone, doctors couldn't see it. And if they had cut me open, they would have cut my, clav my, sub uh, my artery, which would have been fatal. Besides the anesthesia, the artery would have been cut and I wouldn't have survived. Now, it's all good and well looking at the bones on screen like that because you don't have soft tissue or anything around. So how do you know what else to do? So what we did was we knew that there was issues of muscle and tendons and other areas that are damaged. So I'm essentially come from an area what we call biohacking. And there's a gentleman that we've adopted this from in Canada where you take apples and you extract the cellulose over it and it leaves a bio scaffold that your body won't reject because it's biocompatible. They're using it at the moment to grow stem cells onto for creating cartilage to grow ears so that they can do transplants and do tissue grafts over it. What we then also did was I had to look at alternative means. And coming from the jewelry field, we work with a lot of chemicals. And we created a chemical where we were then able to take pure cotton, shove it into this chemical, which then dissolves the chemical and turns it into a complete liquid. Now, the reason why we're doing this is that we're wanting to create a synthetic silk in such a way that it's primarily protein and carbon, which your body will reject because those are the kind of things that your body produces anyway. So once we did that, we then created another um, chemical, which we then create a composition when you can see we inject it, and we then pump it straight into the solution, which makes um, a synthetic silk. It polymerizes it immediately into protein and carbon. Now, th these processes are relatively new and still have to go through a lot of clinical trials, but 
after us realizing that I stand a chance of losing my arm, we had to work very quickly. And unfortunately, we weren't able to adopt these processes as of yet. But trials are on the go at the moment, and they will eventually be adopted that anybody can kind of do stem cell grafts and be able to grow their own uh, bones or soft tissue again. You can see that's the stem cell graft that we, we would then grow onto. So it's exactly as a, a silkworm would create it. The other process that we looked at was uh, 3D printing of bioscaffolds, which we then can also then grow stem cells onto. From there, we would then be able to modify or take arteries, uh, not arteries, bones from other parts of my body, rescan them and put them back into myself. Now, what I'm going to show you is this is one of the products that we used to do for facial reconstruction, where we used to do mandibles or jaw bones, as most people would know them. Because we normally take from your tibia, which is in your shin, you've got two bones there, you don't necessarily need both nowadays. Uh, so we, could, we would extract from there and put it into the jaw. Now the problem is that the surgeons are wanting to graft from my hip. And by the time they are finished with all the broken bones in my body, I'm not going to have a hip left. So we had to find an alternative plan and very quickly because I want to keep my arm. You know, I don't exactly want to lose it by January and it's not the best Christmas present, is it? So what we did was we eventually found a solution with a, a, a neighboring like, partner as such called Altus Biologics where they create a stem cell um, paste that you inject into the body. And by doing this, it then it, it takes the stem cells in my current bones and makes them regrow in the cavity and the breakage areas so that we don't necessarily have to have implants. But judging the way my bones were broken, we've managed to now create a world first where we are able to 3D print in titanium and merge this with it that the bone actually grows through the titanium as a merge. So essentially, I'm like Wolverine then, you know? I can, I, I might peep a lot when I go through those things in the airport, but hey, I'm Wolverine, you know what I mean? So this is the way we would then do the titanium. Now, coming from the jewelry background, this is actually gold powder that we then fuse together by laser. And you can see it pushes layer down by layer and wipes another powder over it and then laser fuses it all together. Now we do the exact same process with the titanium. This is how we've been making my implants. We also do this type of process for making surgical guides so the, the, the surgeons know exactly how to place the implants without cutting any major arteries. As you can see, the detail when it, uh, is extremely, extremely fine. We, we're printing down to about 12 microns accuracy. Um, in a time frame that you probably wouldn't be able to produce otherwise. You could do casting, but this is a lot more accurate. Now, this is also a world first in many aspects because it's only really coming to play now. Most of the jewelers in South Africa don't even know about this yet. They've heard of it, but never worked with it. I've been working with 3D printing since 1996, so this is my 20th year, and it's only really come to play over the last five years. So... This has been exposure for me since 2006, so it's 10 years now. You can see the fine detail of it. It's things that you wouldn't be able to produce otherwise. And this is how we're starting to make our jewelry also supplying retailers. So it's kind of of a merge for me right now. So you're probably wondering where we're at right now is with all this going on and having developed this world first in implants, we're now able to not only change my life, I'm hoping that I'll be able to change others by my story. Because at the end of the day, even though I'm standing here fully braced still and holding most of my body still together, I hope that you will look at your passions differently and that this word of this story will get around and that other people will start to live as healthy as I am again. When you saw in the beginning, my life was literally over and I've managed to fight back. You can too. Thank you.